perhaps, said Saul. Yes, said David, from a sling. I can't throw a spear. King Saul looked down at this mighty man of valour. And then, he said, and what will you do then, my young friend? I shall cut off his head with his own sword, said David, and walked out. And a moment later he came back. Uh, you needn't worry about the reward, he said, and I'm too young to get married. Saul watched the whole thing, the calm, small figure of the boy, the stone slung like a bullet, the great metallic crash as the giant fell, and the beheading with the absurdly large sword that the boy could hardly lift. Then the terror of the Philistine army, and the quick victory for Israel. After David had killed the giant, his life changed completely. He stopped being a shepherd and went to live in the king's household and was treated almost like one of the family by King Saul, who was very grateful about the giant. One of the king's sons was called Jonathan, and he and David took to each other at sight, and as the years passed, they became like brothers. And as the years passed, David, the boy who killed the giant, became David the soldier who killed many of the king's enemies. In the ceaseless battles with Philistines, David's skill and complete lack of fear soon made him noticed, and Saul made him commander-in-chief. Saul was a strange man, very moody, emotional, unbalanced, given to sudden rages and dreadful fits of depression. As David grew to manhood, he came to know this dark side of the king very well, for often Saul would allow no one but David near him during his times of what the court doctors called the evil spirits. The king would send for David, who would play upon the small harp and make up songs, and David would sit sometimes for hours making music to calm the king. But, as I say, as David became a man, he became a great soldier and was often away when the king's evil spirits attacked him. It was noticed at court that news of a victory for David would first please the king and then bring on a great rage or a deep depression. David, famous since a boy as the giant killer, was now as a handsome, broad man in bronze armor, the hero and champion of all Israel. The people made up songs about him, and Saul heard them, and the dark moods changed their character. He became convinced that David was trying to steal the throne from him. He began to plot ways to kill David. He would send him on dangerous missions with too few men. He would put paid assassins among David's troops. But God, who had chosen David for a special purpose, looked after everything. Saul didn't know it, but he was right. The next king would be David. But David would not need to steal the throne. He would be put on it by God much later though. Meanwhile, Saul plotted and was filled with jealousy and fear. Not all the time. When he was normal, Saul treated David as a son, heaped honors upon him, even gave him one of his daughters called Michal for a wife. But it was an atmosphere that could not continue. On two occasions when David was playing upon the lyre, Saul, far from being soothed by it, had suddenly hurled a spear. David's reactions were fast as a cat, and both times he ducked, but it had been close. One day, Jonathan went to David and told him that Saul was scheming yet again. Take my sister, your wife, said Jonathan, and find a house. Live away from the palace and the king. It's safer. David took the advice, and things were a bit easier for a while. He lived quietly when not away with the army and gave orders that he wanted no parades or banner-waving or conquering hero stuff, as it only annoyed Saul. He behaved, as always, in a loyal and principled way, but he was dealing with a man not quite sane. One night, he got home, and Michael looked very worried indeed. Jonathan has been, she said, Father has given orders that you are to be arrested in the middle of the night and charged with treason and killed tomorrow morning. No trial. By the king's order. David stood still. He had the feeling 
that a new chapter was beginning. Michael looked up into his face. My father has spies everywhere, she said. I've made a sort of dummy and put it in your bed. It's got a goat's hair wig. We'll have supper and retire early, and we'll leave a, a dim light in the bedroom, and the dummy will fool anyone looking in. When the house is quiet, you can escape through the garden. Don't worry about me, she said. My father will be angry, but, but he will not harm me. David looked into his wife's eyes. I shall go to the prophet Samuel, he said. He made Saul king, and when I was a boy, he anointed me too. He is a great man and will know what to do. All this was foreseen, Samuel told him. A king you shall be, and Saul now knows this, but the path to your throne will be hard. Assassins sent by Saul have already followed you here, but were made powerless and dazed by God. Saul too came and fell into a fit and tore off his clothes and lay for a day and a night like a beggar under a tree. David felt sad. He was a simple good man and felt himself to be surrounded by great forces. Also he knew the, the other Saul who was generous and good company and indeed you will remember his father-in-law. What of Michael, my wife, who helped me escape, he said. Samuel paused. Uh, well, she has been sent to Galim by Saul and made wife to a man called Faltiel. One day you will get her back. Not yet. Now you must go from here. Go to my friend Achimelech in the town of Nob. He will give you shelter and also the great sword of Goliath the giant. It is yours by right. Go then to the cave of Adalam, where I will see to it that your seven brothers and your parents will join you, also others, four hundred. They will be your first force. Go now. David did, as the old man said, and all this came to pass, and he felt better. Then he heard that Saul had killed Achimelech for helping him and had wiped out the whole town of Nob in a mad revenge. David now saw that Israel must be split into two, those for him and those for Saul. He knew it to be a bad thing, for Israel had the enemies enough without civil war, but it had to be. Now he and his 400 were outlaws. Soon there were 600. David trained his men and they lived off the land. Saul hunted and hounded them without rest. There was one fantastic occasion when Saul, tired at the end of a fruitless day of searching, took shelter in a cave and went to sleep. Further back in the cave were David and a small band of his men. They wanted to kill Saul, but David stopped them. He was like a father to me, he said, and he was anointed king by Samuel, as I was, anointed by a prophet of God. Then David quietly cut off part of Saul's robe, and he and his men left the cave. When Saul awoke and came out into the open, David called to him from across the valley and told him how near he had been to death. But not by my hand, he said. You hunt me to kill me, but I will not harm a hair of your head. See, I cut only your robe with the sword which could have cut your throat. God will judge between you and me. Saul stood still. David watched him and recognized the sign of a calm, sane period in the king. David, said Saul, you're better than me. You've repaid my evil with good, where I try only to repay your good with evil. And now I know that you will surely be king of Israel, a strong, firm Israel in your hand. I ask only that my descendants and my name shall not be destroyed. David swore this to Saul, but knew better than to think that the king's sanity would last or that war was over between them. He was right, as we shall be hearing. But first we have to know that great Samuel, the kingmaker prophet of God, never saw David crowned.
He died not long after the cave incident I just spoke of. But that's not the last we hear of him, though. He still has a strange and important part to play in this story, as we shall see. When King Saul had promised David that he would stop trying to kill him, David didn't set much store by it. David knew that he was dealing with a man who was half mad, and he was right. Saul did not stop. It got worse. David again tried to make Saul see sense without bloodshed. He and one of his men, both first-class guerrilla fighters, crept through the lines of Saul's bodyguard one night and stole the king's spear and water jar from where he slept. In the morning, from a high crag across the valley from Saul's camp, David told Saul how easily he could have killed him. Saul again said how sorry he was and a lot of other things, but David knew he was not really safe anywhere. Then David had a think. And he thought of one place where Saul might not follow him. And David and his 600 men went to the city of Gath, where the giant had come from. The city was deep in Philistine country, enemy country to Saul. David went to the prince of Gath, who, Philistine or not, uh, had a high regard for David the fighter, the soldier, the leader. Uh, David was frank and asked for refuge as now he too, like the prince, was an enemy of Saul. The prince gave David some land and he and his men settled in. The prince, rather crafty, had chosen land on the Israelite border knowing that David's men would live by plunder and hoping to increase the enmity between David and Saul. But David, just as crafty, plundered the Amalekites to the south, leaving no survivors to point out the difference. Over a year passed. And Saul stayed well away. The prince, believing that David was now a firm enemy of Israel, made him his bodyguard. But his generals, who were preparing for a big battle with Saul, did not trust David, and on the day of the battle sent him and his men back behind the lines. Saul had heard of these battle preparations, and he too had made ready. But when he saw the huge Philistine army, he was shocked and scared and sadly missed David, who had been his commander-in-chief. Saul asked God for advice. But God, who was not very pleased with Saul, wouldn't answer. So Saul did something that pleased God even less. He went to see a witch, the witch of Endor. He went disguised, but witches know, and she recognized him. She was frightened for Saul had forbidden all mediums and witches and wizards, but he told her that this was a special job. Call back from the dead, he said, the, the prophet Samuel, who made me king, and is a friend of God who won't talk to me. The old witch, who knew her job, got busy with her bits and pieces, and sure enough, fairly soon, there was the spirit of old Samuel, and not very pleased about being disturbed. Yeah. If God won't speak to you, he told Saul, it is because he has turned from you, as I told you he would, after you disobeyed him. Israel's next king will be David, whom you hunt like an animal. Uh, I've somehow known that for some time, said Saul. Uh, what about the battle? Old Samuel paused. Eh, Israel will suffer a great defeat, he said. The Philistines will live in Israel's cities, and many of Israel's sons will be killed. He paused again. Sons of yours will be killed also, he said. And you, Saul, will also die. Saul was terrified and threw himself at the spirit's feet. When he looked up, the spirit had gone. And it all came to pass. The defeat, the massacre, the killing of Saul's sons, Jonathan and two of his brothers. Jonathan, the great friend of David. And lastly, the death of Saul himself, who, wounded and afraid of capture, had himself killed with his own sword. When the news was brought to David, he wept. He felt again that he was part of a huge design, how 